Good morning, night. everyone. I'd ask you to please take your seats so that we can get underway with the uh, next part of our program for today. Well, a continued good morning to everyone. I'm Jim Gomes. I'm the director of Clark University's Mazakowski Institute for Public Enterprise. And my role today is to introduce our first ever Gorel Symposium. Before I do that, though, I'd like to echo what Provost Baird said, uh, that I am really excited and proud for Clark to be hosting this year's Gorel Lecturer, Senator Elizabeth Warren. She is a true national treasure, and she's also uh, an example of what you can do if you combine really knowing your subject matter and bringing a real passion and your values with you every day when you get up in the morning. Uh, it's, those, it's that combination of really knowing your stuff and really caring about um, changing the world that lets you do what we talk about at Clark, which is to challenge convention and change the world. So thank you again to Senator Warren and to her great staff for making this possible here today. Um, on a personal note of my own, I first met Dr. Lee Gorell about seven years ago. Um, and that meeting led to another and led to another and have led to many more over the years. Um, as a result, um, this is the sixth time we've gotten together to uh, present a Gorel lecture. And um, my life has really been enriched by my friendship with Lee and by all he has done for Clark and for the Mazakowski Institute. Um, thank you, Lee, for all of that. And I'm looking forward to producing many more of these things with you in the years to come. Thanks. I also want to thank Mass Inc., um, Clark's partner in conceiving of and producing this year's Gorel events. For those of you who don't know Mass Inc. and its flagship publication, Commonwealth Magazine, if you are interested in policy and politics and civic life in Massachusetts, you really owe it to yourself to become a regular reader of, make that subscriber to Commonwealth Magazine. Um, Mass Inc. and Commonwealth play a unique role in the life of this state, and they really increase our understanding both of Beacon Hill and of city and town halls all around Massachusetts. So thank you to Mass Inc. for being such a great partner in this endeavor. Um, I also want to say how grateful I am for the teamwork here at Clark that made today's events possible. Um, for Clark students who are in the audience and who are skipping yet another class, um, I know that many Clark students get frustrated with the number of group projects that we assign to you. Um, but I must tell you, most of the professional life that awaits you after you leave here is a series of group projects. That's why we do it. And fortunately, Clark is blessed with many people who exemplify grace under pressure and who care more about getting the job done and done well than they do about who gets the credit for it. It would take me too long to name everyone who worked together to produce this year's Gorel events. But physical plant, media services, event planning, marketing and communications, campus police, food services, advancement, information technology, academic administration, and a platoon of students all work together to put today, to today's events together and to make them possible, all under the skilled and patient coordination of the incomparable Lisa Coakley of the Mazakowski Institute. So thank you all very much. Now on to our Gorel Symposium. This is the first time we've added a panel discussion to our Gorel Lecture Program and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from this thoughtful group of observers and participants in the field of education in America who bring a range of perspectives to our subject today. Included among those observers and participants is Clark's own Professor Kate Balachik, the director of our Hyatt Center for Urban Education and moderator of today's panel. 
Kate's research and teaching reflects a wealth of urban education experience and insight that stretches around the world from Singapore to here in Worcester's Maine South. A computer scientist before she became a scholar in the field of education, Kate is an advocate for equity in developing technological sophistication for all of our students. Kate is originally from the great state of Michigan, and she combines just the right amount of Midwest niceness and Wolverine intensity, as I think you will soon see. Please welcome Kate Balachik, who will introduce the panel. Thanks, Jim. It gives me great pleasure to welcome everybody today um, and to welcome our wonderful panelists here. Um, I'd like to introduce um, at the end Jean Wilhoit, who is the executive director of the National Center for Innovation and in Education. Beside him is Ronald Ferguson, uh, the director of the Achievement Gap Initiative at Harvard University. And next is Diane Kelly, superintendent of Revere Public Schools. And beside me is Ronald Ferguson, the director of, a, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm, I am proud to be known as Ron Ferguson. <laughs> I am. I am. Okay, so that means I won't goof up again, right, if I've already done my goof up. Um, is Nick Donahue, president and CEO of the Nellie May um, Education Foundation. So to begin with, I'd like to give us an opportunity just to hear a little bit from each of you about some of the critical issues. So I'd like to start with um, drawing attention to the, the title of today's symposium, The Next Generation Learning, Opportunities for Urban Education in the New Federal Law. And to start, it would be great if each of you could briefly sketch, and I do mean very briefly, um, so that we could go in more depth um, as the panel progresses, what each of you see as two critical issues for urban education under the new law. So Jean, would you like to start sure. us out? I think the, the first is um, the new law is um, an opportunity. It has uh, language uh, that references um, best practice. It points out innovative programs, uh, but it gives very little direction. Uh, to um, urban districts about how to approach the next phase of reform. So the first for me would be, uh, do we have the capacity uh, and the will to take this law and without federal prescription uh, become leaders in education reform? Uh, this is where the kids are. This is where the most extreme problems exist. Uh, in urban areas in this country, and uh, uh, this is the area that uh, we're going to have to focus our attention. Uh, related to that is this continued federal attention to lowest performing schools, and we find many of them concentrated in urban areas. Um, the 5% solutions that have been on the table thus far, I think, have been uh, dismal failures. We have not moved student performance uh, to the level that we need to in these low-performing schools. We're removing the federal uh, prescription around the models that one would take on, and it is an open invitation for us to redesign structures. Are we at a point in our history, do we have the knowledge base, do we have the wherewithal to truly transform these schools? They should, in the ultimate world, uh, schools with the dropout rates that were mentioned by the Senator Warren this morning should not even exist in this country, and yet we've not made a dramatic impact on them. That'd be Thank two. You. Thank you. Ron? I guess um, <clears throat> the, the new law authorizes, or it, it maybe even requires, districts to have uh, at least one measure other than standardized test scores, other than academic measures, to, to judge the quality of school systems. And uh, a lot of folks have been leaning toward using measures of socio-emotional socio learning um, for this purpose. And one of the things that, that's really being mobilized, actually, right this minute, is the folks who actually work on a lot of these 
measures of socio-emotional well-being do not think these measures are ready to be used for uh, school accountability. Uh, most of them have not been validated as um, appropriate for measuring differences between schools. And so we need to um, give the field more support on knowing which things are appropriate for measuring differences between skilled schools. We've got measures of student perspectives on the, on the quality of the instruction that they receive uh, can be used and have been validated in some of my own work for measuring differences between schools. Also, uh, school student perspectives on school climate um, uh, are appropriate for measuring differences between schools. So we do have some things that, that are appropriate, but uh, a lot of the discussion is headed off in the direction that the folks most expert on those particular metrics would argue should not be used for that. So that's one um, issue. And, and very closely related to that issue is the issue of whether at the state and the local level, people have the capacity to uh, effectively use all the new autonomy that, that they have. People are being asked to make decisions that they never had to make before. Uh, and so the question is what new supports might we need to put in place? Uh, where, whose job is it to make sure that capacity gets built? Um, it's just, we're in a, a very amorphous kind of phase right now where there are reasons to worry that either things won't happen or that the wrong things will happen as we move forward. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And Diane? Um, so I guess I, th there are so many things to choose from, but um, <laughs> the two that I'll talk about first, one of them is uh, that really excites me in the new law is the opportunity to get away from strict use of standardized assessment measures uh, to rate schools and students uh, and to move on to opportunities to have performance-based assessments which I feel will, will more accurately capture what students know and are able to do in a variety of different settings for a variety of different students. Uh, we've all known for a long time that there are some people who quote unquote don't test well and that's not been addressed in how we look at student performance or school performance and so I'm excited for the opportunity to think innovatively about how else we can help students demonstrate their learning. Um, the second thing that I think about when I think about the law, especially reflecting on the Senator's comments this morning about um, how the law seeks to channel funding to those students who need it the most and who have uh, the largest educational gaps to close. In Revere, where we have a high immigrant population and we are a majority minority school district, we face a lot of challenges with students who come from uh, so socioeconomically disadvantaged homes. And we understand what it takes to educate those kids, but recently the governor's budget where he infused and is proud to say that he infused $72 million of additional um, FY17 Chapter 70 monies, uh, when we really look at where that $72 million went, it did not go to gateway cities. And so it's a concern for me when I think about the federal legislation and how that's really being implemented in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and, and specifically speaking about the budget where we changed from a metric of low income um, to identify students living in poverty to a new metric called economically disadvantaged. And when we do that, we see urban districts like Revere with multi-million dollar budget cuts that are gonna just completely impede our ability to help these students who need the extra support uh, get what they need. And that is a concern to me. The governor's budget um, funnels 10% uh, budget increases from last year to this year to 11 districts, none of which are urban and none of which are gateway cities. Of the 25 districts that are getting between 5 and 10% increases, only two are gateway cities. Um, the vast majority, in fact over two-thirds of the gateway cities in the state of Massachusetts will see a less than 1% increase in their budget from last year to this year if, the governor, if what the governor proposes goes through. So it's concerning that as we're talking about moving money to those students who really need it, we don't see that happening um, at the state level. Great, thanks. Great, I'll try to um, be additive here. I think 
you know, some on the positive side, I think the advancing uh, policies to really promote more innovative approaches. So there's a seven state pilot in the uh, law that allows some states who are ready to move forward to really try to expand the nature of assessment toward more performance oriented events that are complex, that are challenging, that are have differential outcomes. And the great piece there from our perspective at Nellie May is not just the advancing of innovation, it's that they're staging the advancement. So I think it's instructive for state law that if you want to adopt simple practices uh, that really don't demand much in terms of systems change, you can ask everybody to do something all at once. But if you really want to move things creatively forward, you better work with a smaller group of people to pave the way. And I think the law models that, and I think that's good. Um, I'm excited about uh, the shift down to uh, the local sites. There's a lot expected of districts. There are expectations around stakeholder engagement. I mean, these are systems of public education. So it's exciting that there are provisions where actually the public needs to be engaged at the state and local level. The big issue on the flip side, of course, is that these are great ideas, but when you release someone from prison or, or been locked down, they don't immediately exercise themselves as free citizens. There's a curve there. You need to sort of, you know, reawaken, remember what it's like. So given this freedom and flexibility is good, but do our districts really have the capacity to really step forward for the opportunity. And the, the last thing I think that is hugely important is that the law is a, is a great compromise. And it's an important step forward from a, a, the No Child Left Behind uh, version. Um, I had the privilege of implementing that law when it first came out in New Hampshire as a state chief. It was very challenging, so I'm very grateful that it's moved forward. But uh, it's a compromise, and there are conflicts in it. And I think they've yet to show themselves. One that I'll name, for example, is that there's a differential um, bar for the use of research. So the way we read the law, if you're working with targeted populations of kids who really uh, need and deserve help, there's really a very high threshold for the kinds of research that you use to advance and promote new practices. But more generally speaking, there's more room available for more general approaches in districts. So now you've got these competing thresholds of research for what's allowed. And the great irony would be that young, poor people, poor people of color will certainly have the safeguards of the science behind research and learning, but will they be limited in terms of the exposure to creative new practices that have not yet met the threshold? So I think that compromise piece is bothering me. I met with some of the staff in Washington from some of the leads on the bill, and I asked them what they had not been able to accomplish. And there was one Democrat and one Republican, and they just rattled off the more, um, you know, the more partisan positions that they couldn't each get against the other. I didn't hear the, the, the idea they shared that they just wish they could move forward in unison because that was not the nature of the deliberation. Okay. So all four of you have talked um, about the issue of increased opportunity but um, a worry about capacity. So I was wondering if, if you could say a bit more about um, directions for states and districts to take to build such capacity and either directions that are really needed to elaborate that a little bit, or particular strategies that you think would be powerful to, to create that capacity? At, at, the, at the state level, um, we've developed institutions that uh, are gonna need to reflect very deeply about um, their role, their function. Um, although there have been some real progress made over the last few years in trying to shift the, uh, complementary role that districts would have with, uh, with the state. Um, a lot of the states still don't have the skill set inside the agency uh, to be true partners with districts. So um, there is a, a real issue about uh, both uh, capacity of states in this time, these times when since 2008 they've reduced the state uh, department staff uh, and uh, they have um, uh, generally in state legislatures uh, begun to uh, look at them as the first point of uh, a resource uh, reduction before they go to the school. So there is reduced capacity there. It's not just reduced numbers. It is a shifting in the role that they must play. In order to carry out the kind of uh, area issues that, uh, that are mentioned in uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, uh, you're going to have to have deep expertise in, in teaching and learning. So SEA capacity is an issue. At the local level, there's business as usual, 
And how does one interrupt that in a way to bring about these deep conversations that are going to be necessary about the future, how they can redesign uh, learning uh, programs and opportunities for students, and how they can bring resources into that district in a way that uh, results in strong planning and implementation of, of the kinds of shifts that are underway. The, um, the other part of this is I think this uh, law is calling for a different kind of relationship between states and districts. Um, we've operated so long with a sort of, you, you come up with a state solution, uh, it's passed to, down to the local districts, uh, it's implemented at that level. Uh, this law hints at um, a much more collaborative process uh, and I think the best models coming forward would be for within a state context for states to form strong relationships with districts, particularly districts who are in a leading position, have will and capacity, to use those as laboratories for learning and then to reflect policy on that, sort of turning things upside down in how we do business rather than coming up with a solution and passing it down. Let's use these laboratories of innovation uh, reflect on what implications there are for scalability and for systems design at a, at a state level. Others? Um, <clears throat> I think the, the first step may be to more effectively use the capacity we already have. Um, there's some districts that, that have more than others do. There is private sector consulting capacity. Um, you can imagine having districts share certain types of expertise. You may have a region where you have a few people who are really good analysts of particular kinds of patterns in the student uh, results or who know really well how to um, put together high school schedules or whatever um, to try to take stock of what we have and have almost consortia that share expertise uh, in particular uh, regions. The, um, you can also imagine um, institutes that convene people in job-alike roles to share the state of the art and to be what's essentially what folks are now calling a networked learning community. So you have people who are all trying to solve the same problem and they come together two or three times a year to talk about uh, the state of the art, where they are with their learning and they learn together, not claiming that anybody's got the exact right, right answer. Um, that's a, another thought. And um, with regard to school leadership, I've always, for the last, I don't know how long, been uh, wanting to, to do some work where we harvest the, um, the folk knowledge from the most effective school leaders. Um, every year we, we go around, and Massachusetts has data online where you can see the growth percentile, the average growth percentile of each school which is the closest we come to measuring how much kids are actually learning from year to year at each growth, uh, at each grade. And you can rank order the schools in the state. And it turns out that at the top of that ranking, there are a lot of public schools. Uh, the uh, charter schools get more attention because they have the advocacy uh, engine going, but you can also find public schools there. And we can go inside those public schools and ask those leaders, how do you do it? And we've done some of that, and when you do it, they give you sort of the kind of informal insights that you won't find in the leadership articles and textbooks. It's really subtle things that they're doing. And you can imagine going in, harvesting that folk knowledge, and having institutes where school leaders attend these things, you know, two or three times a year to learn the tricks of the trade uh, from their colleagues at the most effective places. So basically, we're talking about in various ways setting in place systems where uh, we learn from the best of what's already happening and support that learning in a way that it, that it takes root. So I guess, I guess for me, um, one of the major things that we need to do uh, across the country, but also in the state of Massachusetts, is really change the dialogue around public education uh, away from this place where we're using data to almost vilify teachers in schools um, when really that's a, a, a misuse. We, data is really important. I'll tell you, I should start by saying that when education reform occurred in 1993 and we start, first started our MCAS testing, Revere High School ranked seventh from the bottom of all high schools in the state. And we're proud for the last two years to be able to say that we are, last year, the only level two urban district in the state. This year we are pleasantly joined by Everett Public Schools and Cambridge Public Schools. Um, I will put the caveat that Cambridge spends twice as much money per pupil than we do. <laughs> um, 
You know, our schools are doing great, and the reason our schools are doing great is because we use data appropriately. Um, we like having data to reflect on, but we use it to drive our instruction. And when we talk to teachers about data, we almost have to um, decouple ourselves from the state conversation about data, which is all about um, passing and failing and, and all of that kind of thing. I'm glad to have the data to say that we're doing well, but really we need to use the data to say, here's where a lot of our kids have gaps. We're, how are we gonna tackle it? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna make sure we close those gaps? And that goes right back to what Ron just said. It's really about reprofessionalizing education and giving time for teachers to work together and collaborate and learn from the experts among them and among us uh, and that changes how we do school districts. There has to be common planning for teachers every day. That costs money because now we need more teachers to be with the kids while the other teachers are in common planning. So it all comes right back to budgeting and how much, how successful do we really want to be? And let's put the money out as an indicator of how successful we want to be. The Foundation Review Board um, spent the last 18 months reviewing how we should change funding formulas in the state of Massachusetts. Their report came out and was largely ignored. If that continues to happen, then we're not going to see huge increases or the ability for districts to be really innovative and engage teachers in the kind of dialogue and professional work that's going to help move, and move student pr pr performance up a notch. Great. I would add a <clears throat> sort of uh, complimentary response, which is when I think about capacity, I think about people and I think about volume and I think about just who, who are there the most of. And I think about students, I think about parents, and I think about teachers. And I think, you know, the challenges before us, and there's a lot of assumptions behind what I'm going to say, and they're, you know, I work at a foundation, so I get, we get to test things um, and try out new ideas. But, you know, we have an assumption that we really need to dramatically, dramatically change how we understand student engagement. We're living today with a 19th century model rooted in, in 17th century ideals. And it's working perfectly to continue to stratify and to select and to perpetuate you know, structures in our system that really limit our progress, ironically. So if you really want to get out of the box we're in, then we believe you really need to move to a much more customized, much more real world, much more competency-based approach to learning that actually very simply put on the shortest elevator ride when people ask me what we do I say you know we're trying to make education align with what's known about learning and that's a big step so if you want to do that it's called systems change you want to change systems you got to deal with purpose and really culture and values and beliefs you want to do that in a public setting you better reach the people who are authorizers the folks who developed no child of my behind forgot, forgot about the public and it took a couple of years, but finally people stood up and said, you know, this testing regime is just, it's just onerous. It's not good for learning. We're not experts, but it's got to change. So my hope around capacity is that somehow in this state that the leadership probably at the grass tops um, starts to provoke a conversation where, where we get at least one in 30 Massachusetts residents thinking publicly together about public education. I live in a small town in the South Shore. We get a lot of people together for town meeting. We vote on warrants. Why aren't we having an open conversation about the future of public education to move our communities forward? One of the reasons is educational leaders, myself included, really don't trust the public. All right, it used to be that way. We'd, I was commissioner. I'd release test scores on a Friday. I would just, I'd say they're getting better. We got a whole lot of work to do, and I would just pray that nobody really noticed. And that was really arrogance and fear, right? So I didn't trust the public, and that's crazy because the public knows what they're talking about. We've done a lot of research. Americans are interested in progress. They're interested in moving forward. They want to advance. And I just don't understand why we're not inciting a conversation publicly among the parents and community leaders, why we're not just positioning students to be more outraged than they are today about what they're getting, which isn't enough. And in particular, that we remember that things don't move forward without your professional workforce. So at Nellie May, we're really interested in trying to unleash the power of educators to connect together, not to follow some preconceived professional development regimen, but to put their minds together and to advance change in their communities based on their leadership. Because the most trusted person in a local community about education are teachers. So we dug ourselves into a big hole with union politics. But I just think the pluralism that describes our, our democracy has not been tapped fully when it comes to thinking about the future of public education. And Massachusetts is the home of the revolution, right? So maybe we can be the home of a future revolution to rethink what schooling means and to end batch processing in schools and head toward universal attainment of deeper learning outcomes so our society can move forward. 
That's what I hope the law provides. Kate, there's a, there are real implications for higher education in this uh, shift. Uh, and, and I could just mention two or three. One, uh, we still need juried research, uh, but it's not having a direct impact on the teaching and learning process to the degree it should in this country. So I think uh, universities beginning to think about how they can get inside schools on a regular basis, be a part of that planning process, the just in time or the action research that's necessary, which allows the schools to learn from those experiences, make adjustments, be guided and directed and supported uh, by higher education. And then the reports coming out of that can be helpful to, uh, to a, a scalability. A second one is the systems alignment issue. Um, uh, the, the most powerful uh, voices to high school students are those folks that they're going to be aspiring to, to, uh, to reach to. And, and uh, higher ed folks have much more influence than high school teachers when you get to those uh, uh, junior and senior years. Uh, developing uh, a very thoughtful and connected relationships between high school kids and middle school and high school kids and higher ed institutions. Uh, setting up direct relationships between professors and students, putting them with some sort of technology-based planning process that allows them to make judgments, supporting their thought process and giving them ambitions to move forward and dreams for the future. Uh, higher ed can play a major role in that alignment. And then finally, I think on, on this issue of higher ed, um, we're in a time of transition. And I think the preparation programs need to have a, a really thoughtful analysis of where they are, what they're teaching, what courses uh, students are engaged in. Are they aligned with the kinds of themes that are coming out uh, these days and what kind of changes are necessary? And how do you begin to have a much more lasting impact on those students once they leave your programs and move into, into teaching situations. We've, we have a curve here of teacher growth in those early years um, uh, as they launch, but it seems to wane as they, they go through their experience. They don't have that kind of rich resource base coming from higher education to keep them uh, engaged and moving forward. So I think for higher education, there are tremendous opportunities uh, uh, in this kind of uh, environment. Can I just chime in too? The, um for the last 20 or so years, I've gone in and out of working with schools, some, some years much more than, than other years. And the, um, one of the biggest problems I see is the incoherence of the professional learning system from the perspective of teachers. Okay, you've got all kinds of ideas coming at you from all kinds of directions, from all kinds of people, Leaders not giving you clear direction about which ones you're supposed to pay the most attention to, uh, with nobody doing the crosswalk between the different frameworks that are, that are coming at you. Um, I can remember being in one um, meeting with some teachers, and we were talking about some issues, and they said, oh yeah, that's already in the frameworks that we're using. And um, I said, well, what else is in the frameworks that, that you're using, and what are the key themes? And, they start digging through their papers. <laughs> um, there were things that should have been front of mind that were not, things they should have memorized that they hadn't. Um, but the reason they hadn't, because that was just one list. <laughs> they got another list and another list and another list. Okay, and so when we started talking about going into schools and um, doing it in, in more modern ways, mm -hmm. it's gonna hit the teachers as just one more list of things to do. And so there's this, a challenge of, of how we all get on the same page. And it's, it's very difficult. I'm just, I'm a, as a consultant, I go in, I just got one more list <laughs> from the perspectives. Okay, we, I do a lot of surveying in schools and we, we put survey reports back into teachers to use to inform their professional learning, feedback from their students. Um, but again, it's just one more source of information. There's often not a coherent conversation organized around the feedback that the teachers get. And so the challenge is to figure out um, how to make the job doable <laughs> for, for a teacher. Um, I think a lot of this, I'm not as big a fan as a lot of other people are about with coming up with a lot of new ideas about. If we just use the old ideas well, um, we might be in much better shape. And um, 
the trying to layer new ideas on top of the old ones before we've actually even perfected the delivery system for the old ones just makes it more complicated. And so the question is, is how do we sort all this out when each of us comes and thinks we have the answer? <laughs> okay, and you've got 10 of us coming to the same school. All of us think so we have the answer. Um, it's, uh, and I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just. <laughs> Diane, do you have a sense of, as a district leader, how you deal with that issue? Yeah, I, I think Ron hit the nail right on the head, which is teachers feel inundated, especially in the last um, six or seven years. I'd say teachers really feel overwhelmed by the volume of new initiatives that are coming at them from every direction, from um, you know, new, uh, the new frameworks in the state of Massachusetts, the educator evaluation system, district determined measures. You could go on and on and on. It's exhausting. And um, I, you know, I think one of the reasons that Revere has been successful is because we've nurtured an environment of innovation. So um, we've been talking to teachers about, and being a t having been a teacher myself, you always just wanted to have a normal day. You wanted to come in and have everything go as it should and no kids got wildly upset and nobody was sent to the office and there was no big drama coming from the school. You just wanted to have a normal day. And um, what we've been trying to work with our teachers on understanding is that that's just no longer something that happens. <laughs> um, we have to look at every day as a day of change and a day of innovation, but we also have to give the teachers the support, th the support they need to try different things. And we have to give them the freedom to understand it's all right if it's not perfect. Because as we learn to improve our practice, we have to make mistakes along the way. It's the same message that we give to our students, but for some reason, um, we as a society think that uh, everything is supposed to be perfect in the public schools every single step of the way. And so that limits people's comfort with trying to innovate or try different kinds of approaches and different strategies. Um, even if the change and the innovation isn't perfect, it can be better than what was in place before. So we have to um, take the time and have faith in each other and be able to let teachers and groups of teachers in schools try innovative new ways of instructing students and assessing students and doing all of that work that's going to make the work more personal and more connected for the kids so that they're able to go on and be successful beyond high school but also in, you know, beyond school period in life. Now you just said let the teachers. Yes. What about induce the teachers? That's right. Yeah. Um, allowing them to do it doesn't help if they weren't, aren't inclined to jump out and do it. Right. Because there's kind of an inertia. So, so, as, how a, do you so induce, as a school how do you leader, spark? Yeah. I can induce that because yeah. I hold them through the process and let them know that I'm going to make them feel comfortable if they try new things and there aren't going to be repercussions. But they still feel that tension from the state and from the public, from parents, from other people. And that's you know, the comment I made earlier about we have to change the dialogue around what's happening in public schools. People have no idea of the wonderful, creative, innovative, hardworking teachers that populate these public schools across the Commonwealth. Can I ask a question? Oh, please. Okay, in, in your district, do you, I mean, to the degree that there are wonderful teachers who have great ideas. Mm -hmm. okay, are there ways for other teachers to have access to that, to learn about other, one another's great ideas? Is there any structure to the way that happens? There are. So for the last four years, we started, actually, it was, we do have one innovation school in the um, city of Riviera. And our innovation school started experimenting um, with professional learning communities. And then through the Nellie May Foundation, we had a grant that allowed us to restructure our high school where we were able to work in professional learning communities there as well. Um, in the alternative school, in the, sorry, in the innovation school, um, the teachers meet once a week for their professional learning communities. At the high school, it's twice a week. We also have three expanded learning time schools where those teachers meet daily. Um, and so we have our professional learning groups where we have trained teacher leaders uh, in each school, we have about 65 of them across the district who, who facilitate the uh, professional learning communities. And in that way, we're able to honor teachers as leaders of each other, and they can have those leadership experiences, and there's more of a sense of professionalism while they're still in the classroom. There are not a lot of opportunities like that traditionally in public school systems because either teachers are teachers or they're administrators, right? So uh, one way that we can help professionalize 
uh, the community of teachers is by creating more teacher leadership opportunities. And that's just one of the ways that we've done it in Revere. We do, I mean, with our educator, evalu when we had the educator evaluation protocol change in the state of Massachusetts, we actually call us an educator growth model because we don't believe in educator evaluation, we believe in educator growth. Uh, although, admittedly, we do sometimes have to uh, evaluate a few people. Um, but because we have a culture around educator growth, we are more focused on how we can all learn more from each other. And so when we implemented the new system, we had a team of 30 teachers trained to lead the new process. And they're the ones who trained the administrators on how to do observations in classrooms, on how to document those observations, how to give feedback to teachers, et cetera. So we work very hard to establish a culture in Riviere where it is about teacher leadership. Um, the teachers are the ones who are gonna bring the kids to new levels. Those kinds of relationships that the teachers have with each other transcend into how the kids have relationships both with teachers and with each other's, and that's how we're able to um, have some of these positive results in Riviera. So I hear um, each of the speakers use the word innovation quite a bit, and, um, and part of the title of today's talk is, or symposium is um, Next Generation Learning. So I, I would love it if you could talk a little bit about how in a system, as, as Diane said, that has been um, working from being vilified through the high stakes testing, through the sense of not performing well, uh, you know, teaching to the test, and schools that really don't look much changed from last century or the century before, how do we move into the 21st century? It's already 2016 and our schools look the same. We're just starting to move out of this, this yoke of, of the high stakes exams with this new law. So how do we really create innovation in the schools? What does that look like? And what does that look like for schools? Is, is, is that the point? I mean, we want schools that work for kids. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the, um, why do you think innovation is the answer? I, mean, I just keep using, yeah, hearing yeah, all I know of that you other people are saying that, it, I'm so sort of I'm pushing yeah, back so a little I, bit. I, I'll give it a try. So, I, I think, no, well, actually, so let's just let, let me just finish, finish the, okay. the point. I mean, we, in the work that we do, we want two kinds of things. We want kids to have basic skills, we want them to develop basic skills. We want them to develop the, the, the mindsets and the dispositions and, and so on. Um, when we look across lots of schools, I mean, we survey millions of kids a year and uh, if you want the basic skills, it's how effectively teachers challenge kids to think rigorously and to persist in the face of difficulty and to stay on task. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that predict it. And maybe you can innovate some to think rigorously, but there's some al already some teachers who really know how to get kids to think rigorously and encourage them to persist in the face of difficulty and to stay on task. If you want them to have um, uh, um, ambitious goals and, and to be inspired to do more, um, the thing to predict that are how um, how interesting the teacher makes the lessons and how personally she connects with the kids. So if you care a lot and you captivate them, they want to be like the teacher, they want to learn more. Okay? There are ways to do that that people already know. Okay? And so, but what we don't have is learning systems in schools mm -hmm. and supports that get people to sink their teeth into these things. People are so stuck in the status quo that they think this is how it's going to be. I just need to get through the day. Like you said, they want to have a normal day. Right, right. All right. And so you could say there's, there's some innovation to be had in how we actually get the, turn the ship, get the boat to move, and to do more of what we kind of already know needs to be done. So I'm not sure whether the line, where the line is between innovation and, and existing knowledge. And, but it seems like it's a lot about implementation. Mm -hmm. It's about putting in place the systems that will allow us to use what we already know uh, more effectively. So I, I guess I would, I would just say that in a lot of ways, what you're talking about is innovation because even though we know that those are the things that are gonna help kids mm -hmm. do better, we don't have the on-demand, in the moment, um, supports for students because of the way that our schools are structured. We're still structured with all kids come in at this time and all kids go home at that time and a period is this long and lunch is this long and everybody must take this many math classes and this many English language arts classes, et cetera, et cetera, in mm -hmm. order to graduate. 
um, we haven't stepped outside of that box, even though we understand better how kids need support. Like you, you were talking about, in Revere yeah. we talk about our four R's, rigor, relevance, relationships, and resiliency. And that's what we talk about in all of our professional development is how to, how to help kids grow in those areas. Um, but we really need to look at ways, you know, for some kids that can happen very quickly. There should be some kids in the state of Massachusetts who can graduate high school in three years and get on to college. Um, there should be other kids who it might take five years or five and a half or six years, but it shouldn't necessarily mean that a school is bad or the kid is bad because that's how long it took. It might just mean that, you know, he, he or she grew up elsewhere and, ha and, and needed to have some time adjusting to being in a new country and learning a new language before he or she was going to be proficient at what we expect for all kids to be able to do in order to earn a high school diploma. Um, but so we have to decouple those things where, we'll, where, where we say, if you don't graduate in four years, then there's something wrong. Either there's something's wrong with the kid or there's something wrong with the school. And, um, you know, we have to, so that's what I think of when I think of innovation is just changing out of that traditional, everybody's here for the same amount of time, for the same number of days, for the same length of year, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I mean, I would add, I think the conversation, Ron's correct, that the conversation sounds like it's just about doing new things for new things' sake. And I think that's a big mistake in education. And Ron, I couldn't agree more. I think the things you've noted about, you know, highly skilled teachers uh, are transferable to, you know, new settings. So it's critical that we not pretend like this is a new problem. Uh, but Diane said it, and I think more generally, schools are still built on a model where kids basically go through the same thing at the same pace, and if you fall behind and move ahead, you're the aberration. So it's not just an innovation in practice. I think it's more a really an innovation of purpose. And it brings me back to these ideas about public authorization and endorsement. I mean, you know, if you want a system that is good at culling and sorting a select few for an opportunity to take a next step in education, do what we are doing. If you want to advance more people to a promising future, do what we're doing better. If you want to advance a large majority of people forward, then you're going to do things like meeting students where they really are, not where we wish they were because of their birthday. We're going to be passing people forward when we're sure they know things, not just because June rolls around. I have some friends of mine, you know, I hang out they, in my neighborhood and they still have no idea exactly what I do. You know, I'm a foundation CEO. They're just, you know, do I pour foundations? Do I? <laughs> They're not sure. And I sit there with the guys I know and I go, you know, we're really about competency-based education at Nellie May. We want to think about competency-based education. And they're like, great, you know, what's that about? I mean, it must be good. And I go, well, it's when, you know, we advance kids when they really know things. They've mastered things before they go on to learn the next thing. And I, I get this stare, and they're like, well, what have, you, what have we been doing all these years? <laughs> and I go, we move kids forward with, you know, a 75, and that means they, oftentimes they got about three quarters of it. They pile those deficits up, and then we wonder why they drop out of math in college. So we're not, we're not setting them toward mastery. So I, and I'm very anxious at people in today's world who talk about different pacing for different kids, and I will be the first to say, you know, that is a formula for expanding the achievement gap because you'll just reinforce social inequity and you'll see it translated into educational outcomes. So in our day and age, equal, equitable is not equal. It doesn't mean everybody gets the same treatment. It's where you put you know, resources where they're needed and you meet kids where they are. And I think, so that is rooted in innovation of purpose. And that means that people in this country need to think for themselves, look ahead, and consider what kind of education system do we need to succeed as a community and a society. And I have confidence in the people in this country. We've seen, we're experimenting with this now, and it is just eerie the way, put in a particular way, not being force-fed some preconceived answer, that regular folks come to the conclusion that we just need to do things somewhat differently. So Ron, I agree with you, Don't, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, and I think there are edges at places like Revere working on, State of New Hampshire, Connecticut, I mean, it's, it's wildfire around this country, uh, the ideas people are having about just shifting the box a little bit and maintaining the best of our instructional practices, but really moving to a modern age. Yeah, but a, a lot of what you just listed off, is, you could paraphrase as effective differentiation. Um, Absolutely. Right, and when we start to talk about effective differentiation, there are gonna be race and social class differences mm -hmm. in how kids get sorted. Right. To differentiate. Yep. And 
Um, and there's a question of who do we trust to make those calls? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and so there's going to be resistance to effective differentiation because some people are going to be afraid that you're going to take the most vulnerable kids and say, well, they don't quite know it yet, so we can't pass them on yet. Yep. Right? Um, and there's also there, there's some misunderstandings. Um, even there were a couple of misunderstandings, even in what Senator, Senator Warren said. Okay. Um, the, um, there's a common understanding assumption that students of color are um, sorted into special education disproportionately. Okay, the, resort, the research on that topic is, is almost never has the right control variables in it to, to ask what, what were the skills that they had uh, when they were sorted and are we, t are we saying that kids with exactly the same skills are sorted differently by race? Uh, the best study I know of shows that the racial differences in special education placements as of age, as of fifth grade are completely predictable by entry level, kindergarten entry level skills. And the fact is that kids of color are under enrolled in special education because they tend to be at the schools that have a heavy need for it. And the kids that need it for, who are whites tend to be at schools that have, full, have enough capacity to serve everybody who needs it. So the fact is the opposite of conventional wisdom on that one. And so um, if we take that, the first, the incorrect notion as the premise and run off trying to design all the right interventions, we're, we're way off base. Um, right, no, I agree with you on that one. I've heard yes. the same uh, sort of uh, in information spouted. I guess, I guess one, way of, one way of pushing on this question is to, and, and, I, and I agree with Ron, I think it's, <clears throat> there are dangers with any big change and there are massive risks and I'm anxious about it. I'm, I think the new law represents them very well. You know, it's got a real split personality, and I use that term lightly. Um, and I'm very anxious about the ways that different states will be able to act and who will suffer at the hands of the inequity that will reemerge. I think they are huge social issues for us to consider in a country about how we think about moving our society forward. But so one thing we've done is we calculate, we really care about readiness. One of our little bees in our bonnet is that people have been very focused on graduation rate, which is important. You've got to get out of high school to move on. But we think that particularly in the region of New England, and it's true for Massachusetts, that while we're graduating nearly 80% of our young people, and I think Worcester has an 80% graduation rate, that in places like this town, probably 20% of them are really ready. So and that we calculate that simply by meaning if you get into some form of post-secondary and you need some remediation in a course that does not bear credit because it's something you should have learned that you're not ready, and there are other factors to not being ready. And the, you know, the good news is the readiness rate in this country is going up. The bad news is it's going up at 0.3% a year. And in New England and in Massachusetts, it could be the year 2300 on the current pace before everybody's ready. So you can make numbers say anything you want, but that's supposed to make a point that if we keep doing what we're doing and even increase and double the rate of return on the way we're educating now, that it will be the middle of the next century before everybody's ready. So we just think it's time to give some places that demonstrate responsibility, and I know that's hard to monitor, but I think we're very interested in what New Hampshire's done and what the pilot provides, where you know, you, as a district, you don't get to jump in with everybody else at the same time to do something poorly. You need to demonstrate that you have invested in capacity of people who are going to lead the change. So I think there are ways of staging innovation that can be productive. Uh, but I agree, it's a very treacherous time for us where the opportunities to create and innovate uh, could be hijacked and um, you know the jury is out about what this country will do. Will we move ourselves forward by focusing on universal attainment or will we move ourselves backward? And um, it's too soon to tell but I think we need to take some risks in the process. So I'd like to end on a very important issue, the issue that has been raised here of equity and um, ask if each of you could leave the audience with thoughts on what do you see as ways for states and districts to, as Elizabeth Warren has called for, to stand up for their most vulnerable kids? Gee, there's a tremendous bait going on in society. Do we really have a commitment to these young people? Are they really our children? Uh, so I think at a state level, there is still, the jury's still out on whether we're gonna to respond to this resource issue both in terms of adequacy and distribution of resources. Equity is not equal um, resource distribution. Uh, and in a society, uh, we're gonna be asking folks to disproportionately resource highest need areas if we're serious about the challenge. 
That's a tough assignment for a lot of folks in America. Do, am I willing to give up more uh, for the most needy kids in the country? Um, and what we're asking states to do now is to step up and address that uh, with a theory of action different than the way we made those changes in this country. It's, we've made those changes historically through the court system. We've been forced to do so, sometimes with great resistance um, uh, to make these kinds of changes. Uh, but you cannot continue to under-resource the highest need kids and expect positive results. Uh, secondly, I, I think it is this investment in teachers along the lines of what uh, was just described is a tremendous uh, uh, need in the country. Uh, making the teachers, putting the teachers in a position of being the, the producers of knowledge, of, of uh, innovation, of movement forward, uh, rather than consumers of other folks' ideas. And building around those teachers an infrastructure that allows them to learn, grow, expand, uh, and developing systems around those folks that are not counter to uh, what was described earlier about a, a, a positive learning environment. Most of our state systems are uh, historic, uh, have been piled on over years. Uh, none of, many of them don't make sense today, so a really thorough rethinking of what a professional experience ought to be and how we would design systems around it is important. Thank you. Yeah. I think um, we've got to figure out what to do about concentrated poverty and the impacts of concentrated poverty on educational opportunity. Uh, when you have concentrated poverty, the schools tend to be overwhelmed by the, the needs of, of the children. You've got a heavy turnover of the families, um, things are so hard, you then get turnover of the, of the administrators and the teachers, uh, you get instability of various types, and um, you get, frankly, a lot of behavior problems that are occurring partly because of that instability. I'm actually finishing a paper right now where I'm finding that the greatest um, inequality in access to educational opportunity is in access to an orderly classroom. You know, we ask kids questions like, you know, kids in my class behave so badly that it interferes with our learning. You get way too much agreement with that in classrooms where you have concentrated disadvantage. Um, uh, time on task is one of the strongest predictors of learning. And disorderly classrooms don't have the time on task and coherent time on task um, the way they want to. So the, um, so either equipping teachers so they're so good at teaching in these environments or dispersing these environments, one way or another, we got to deal with that. Second issue that I think just keep, get in the picture here is um, we're, we want ultimately all kids to thrive in life. Um, which means that we care about not just whether the money is equitably distributed, but whether the life experiences are, are equitably distributed. And we need to have more discourse about what are the life experiences we want our head, kids to have that really matter. Um, and a lot of it is happening even before school. Achievement gaps by race, socioeconomic status, and gender are clearly apparent in national data by the age of two. Um, and has a lot to do with early childhood life experiences. We're working now to try to saturate Boston with five propositions for early childhood life experience of maximize love, minimize stress, talk, sing, and point, count, group, and compare, uh, explore through movement and play, and read and discuss stories. We want parents to understand that the baby is learning language from the moment they're born. Actually, from before, prenatal, they can hear six months into the womb. They're in there listening for three months before they even come out. Right, and so they're basic ideas about parenting that kids from less advantaged backgrounds don't benefit from as much that ought to be part of the equity agenda because the gaps are there by age two and they're for sure there at age five when the kids start school. They're already playing catch up from the very beginning and if we stay focused only on the money piece of this, we'll have equal money, but we won't have equal life chances because the life experiences will have been so different even outside of school. So I think you both um, had perfect comments there, um, and I would agree with everything that you just said, so, but, but because of the situation we're in this year with the budget and the governor's budget, I'll take this opportunity to reiterate uh, that I think that we as a state need to decide whether or not we're going to invest in 
um, helping our poor students get the education they need and funding those districts that have high concentrations of poverty at levels that will enable us to close gaps or are we going to still just talk about these things and not really do them? Um, because that's a game changer for Revere. If something doesn't happen with the House, between the House and the Senate budgets, um, then Revere will be looking at drastic layoffs and that means our class size will increase, our social workers will disappear, some of the administrators who prevent the problems you were talking about uh, in terms of classroom dis disruptions will be gone and so will our performance level. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Great, and I would just add, um, you know, it sounds like a, a big, you know, I don't know if it's going to sound on point to people, but I think, you know, continuing to advance conversations about race, racism, and white privilege in our communities. I think it is the glue that holds inequity together. It's a, the great malady of our country and our time. Um, and in particular, I think, you know, because power and privilege really are continue to be drawn along racial lines that you know, white people in our country to stand, step up and stand forward and start to really understand white privilege more uh, is a way forward. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to look at this myself. It's scary to me. I'm uncertain. I feel like I'm going to be bad or blamed or all the things that white people feel about race issues. And I also understand that there are concepts like being spared injustice, which is a piece of white privilege. The fact that when I send my children off to school, I don't wonder if they're going to come back uh, home. Uh, for in terms of their safety. My daughter keeps saying she wants to move out, but you know, that's a, one can only wish. Um, but I think, I think people really just putting their attention on the things that are really in the background here. And that's a very difficult conversation to have. There aren't many people or communities that are poised or it takes help. But I think that uh, unless as a country that we put our attention on this and wh white people in particular get up, get behind people of color and advancing conversations around racial justice and injustice, uh, and the related issues of economic justice. And I think to do that, that uh, many of us really need to examine, you know, what it is that is holding us back and what, um, what do we need to experience to understand that to move our society forward, uh, we really need to make a change. And that means advancing the futures of folks who don't um, always look like us or who we might not know that well. Thank you. I heard a lot of talk today about um, difficult dialogue, uh, reflection, really thinking about doing things in, in new and different ways. And I'd like to thank you for hopefully starting that discourse can, can among I, can I the thing? audience here. One quick thing, just as of we course. start. You know, I just, on this particularly, I was listening to my own tone and some of our conversation. I think, you know, the things we've been talking about and the puzzle we're in, you know, we are completely capable of finding our way forward. This is going to get better. It's going to be advanced. It can feel daunting and heavy, but I just think, you know, we're a good people and we have figured out how to do a lot of things. And I think we're going to move forward. It's going to be bright. Our children basically expect that. And so I'm not just cheerleading. I can just, you know, spend too much time on this panel. It sounds like there's a lot of like heavy <laughs> lifting. Oh my God, I got to unpack white privilege today or whatever. But we are able to do this. And I think it's a decision we get to make about whether if we're going to do it. Education is going to modernize. It's going to be available to people with means and wealth. It's going to continue to be a great place for education and we have a crack at this and it is doable and that just means that we got to keep our spirits up hang together and keep going forward so i just wanted to put that little coda on our conversation i think we agree yeah <laughs> no better words to end on please join me in thanking the panel You're awesome. The schools are innovating. Come on, babe. Get on the train. <laughs> totally agree with you. Mostly. Well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having us.